It is my pleasure to welcome back to the program uh, author of a multitude of books and um, Professor Emeritus uh, from UMass and his latest, The Sickness of this is the System When Capitalism Fails to Save Us from Pandemic or Itself. Uh, Richard Wolf, welcome back to the program. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. So, Professor, um, I, I want to get into uh, this, but I got to start. Let me start with this, which I thought was pretty funny because um, there was a, a piece today in the New York Times. Um, Jerome Powell, as you know, the chair of the Federal Reserve, uh, was sending a message to his fellow fellow policymakers. Uh, this was uh, today. Um, he had prepared remarks before the National Association for Business Economics. And he unlined, as he has before, that the economy's resilience owes substantially to strong government support for households and businesses. Now, we can get a little nitpicky about, um, about the, the resilience of this economy. We're already starting to see it being less resilient, as it were. Um, I mean, there, there's, there's a couple of different versions of how uh, non-resilient it is. But I'm just struck by the notion that your argument, in many respects, is the same argument as the Fed chief is. Now, how we would deploy those resources, uh, the government might be a little bit different because I think you're a little bit more oriented to helping people first uh, rather than corporations. But let's talk about this because I, I started the show by saying that we, we have two sort of uh, concurrent problems when it comes to COVID. One is the president, but the other pre-existed COVID and made it that much more difficult for us to deal with both the health implications of this and the economic implications of that. That's, that's your argument. Uh, tell us about it. Well, I think you, you put your finger right on it. Basically what I wanted to do was to take the focus we all have on the illness, the sickness, the, the pandemic, and to say, wait a minute, there's a deeper sickness, a bigger sickness, and indeed it's what made the virus so deadly in this country, that we have an economic system that is sick. And like anything else in life, if one sickness happens on top of another sickness, oh my goodness, you know, everything is multiplied. It, it, it's just a tragedy that we're going through. Part of the argument is very foundational. It says, and I know this is sharp, but it, there's no way around it. Private profit driven capitalism and the public health don't go together. You have to face that. We have in this country, all the factories and offices and stores able to produce adequate quantities and qualities of masks, gloves, ventilators, hospital beds, we can produce what would have been necessary to be prepared for this virus, knowing that we had a catastrophic virus in 1918 in this country, killed 700,000 people, knowing that we've had MERS and SARS and Ebola and all the rest in recent years. We could have been prepared, we should have been. We weren't, we still don't have adequate testing in this country. For example, in our schools so that the children don't become carriers of this disease, etc. Why don't we? Well, the answer is the private profit system. And let me explain it because it's, I will do it from the point of view of the businessman or woman. It doesn't pay to produce millions of masks, stick them in warehouses all over the country, make sure they're clean for the next indefinite period of time, monitor those that wear out, that need to be replaced, security for them all. And for what? For a disease that may not come for years, no private capitalist in a capitalist system is going to do it. And the reason has to be stated starkly. What's good for profit and what's good for the public health clash it's not that the profit system is the best way to do it. It's that the profit, profit system is the worst way to do it because it contradicts profitability. So that's the first thing we have to face. Capitalism doesn't deliver public health. 
which ought to be one of the criteria of a system if you're going to live under it. Okay, I, I want to I want to expand on this a little bit. I mean, let's well, let's define what we're talking about in terms of public health, right? Because we just saw Donald Trump fly to one of the top hospitals in the country, get um, the best treatment you could possibly get. That exists, right? I mean, it, and just coincidentally, it also happens to be completely government run. Uh, all those people. That, let's put that aside for a moment, because um, because many people would say, like, you know, the prince of uh, whichever um, uh, you know Middle Eastern country will come here for you know their cancer treatment. These this is not treatment that is available to. I don't know, 99.9% of the American public. So when we talk about public health, what, what do we, what, I mean, just give me a sense of what, how you define that, just so that we can understand um, like, you know, what, what our capitalist system is not up to um, providing. I mean by public health, an institutional arrangement whereby a certain minimum basic quality of care is a right of the public. It's called the public's health because it's for the public. It is something understood. Every major university has a department of public health where young people are taught what you need to know to make a population healthy. Give them the vaccinations they need. Give them the vitamin. Give them the reg regiments in terms of their diet provide institutions, we call them clinics, hospitals, where they can go for any emergency, injury, illness, you have it. Be prepared for those kinds of injuries you can foresee. You know, you have a, a, a little ambulance next to the football game because people hurt themselves in football and you are to be prepared. We knew what was needed to be prepared for a virus that can come at any time. We knew. We knew what we needed. We knew how to produce it. We didn't do it because it isn't profitable. Right. Let me hammer home one more point. Sure. If you let me. We know even what to do in this case. We don't admit it to ourselves because we, we are fundamentalist when it comes to capitalism in this society. So we don't admit it. But we do know what I just said. No one is surprised. And we know what has to happen. The government has to step in to compensate for the failure of private capitalism to do what we know needs to be done, namely protect us against viruses, among other things. And the government could have. The government could have done, bought the masks, put them in a warehouse, watched them, stored them, cleaned them, repaired them, whatever was necessary. We know. You know how we know? Because that's what the government does with the military. It doesn't pay anyone to produce a missile or a, a guided missile or a, a gun or a ship or a plane or, or, or a tank. Do what? Put it in a warehouse? Watch it for an indefinite period of time until maybe a war comes along? No private capitalist would do it. And that's why the government comes in, buys those things as they roll off the assembly line. And then we, the taxpayers, pay the cost of storing it and waiting indefinitely. But what this government did for the military defense, it didn't do for public health. So the government didn't make up for the failure. So here we sit with a failed economic system and a failed government. Four and a half percent of the people of the world live in the United States, 25% of the COVID cases. It's a failure written in neon over the middle of uh, Times Square. And I just want to, I mean, this is, there, there's a couple of things I want to just uh, address here. And, and, and one is this notion. I mean, the reason why you bring up the military is you're saying like, you know, the, the, the answer is not that our government's not capable of doing this. The right. answer is simply that we have decided as a society, either consciously or unconsciously, and I want, I want to circle back to that, but I want to put in a pin in it for a moment. We have decided as a, as a body politic, we're just not going to do it. We just don't value making sure that our public health is taken care of as much as we value the ability to launch an assault on another country uh, without having to wait for tanks to roll off or, or planes to roll off. Yeah. And, and, and I just want to circle back to, you know, you use the example of, of masks 
and uh, PPE. But also we saw this in the context of hospitals. I mean, in New York state, the moment that we got this under control was when the governor of the state basically, um, I don't, I don't know what the word is when you know it's not nationalized because it's just happened in the state. But every st- hospital in this uh, state, regardless of private or public, came under the purview of the the state government. Now, and I and 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 that was it. The the most obvious, most efficient decision to do because you had resources that needed to be moved from one to another, and you needed some type of, of central coordination for that. We should also note, though, that that there is a lot of data that suggests if you lived in a low income area, you were more likely to die of coronavirus in part because we had cut back on the public hospital system there, or they didn't have adequate hospitals. That's also on the governor. But that is both those two, um, I guess, decisions, political decisions, um, illustrate what you're talking about. Exactly. And, and, and not that the Trump administration is the the hallmark of all evil. These things we're talking about predate the arrival of Mr. Trump, but he did get the, does deserve the credit for making it worse. He tilted more, he gave more money to the military than they even asked for while cutting the budget for the Pandemic Preparations Committee, for the Centers for Disease Control, and so on. He's just part of a tendency uh, to shortchange the public health and at the expense of the of people. I mean, 200,000 or 210,000 dead people in America, that's a more costly loss than most of the military engagements this country has ever participated in. The disproportion here is reflects, you know, it, when I was young, it, we used to be told things in our schools that uh, people in Asia, I, I kid you not, Uh, don't value human life the way we do here in the West. I remember going home, repeating this, and having my father get very upset and give me a lecture uh, about why the teacher was wrong. But here's the joke. In terms of how societies are really reacting to this virus, if anything, it looks like the reverse, that there's much more care there to shut down the society, to save lives, than we have here. The president saying in a public interview, it is what it is, when in fact it didn't have to be. And then to see that black and brown people are suffering disproportionately, the deaths, the illnesses. I mean, what do you think Black Lives Matters is marching about? It's as if the president is literally instituting a program to show that systematic racism functions when life and death itself are hanging in the balance. For me, that's why I wrote the book, to understand we have a system that is our problem. That's why the COVID is so bad here. And so will be the future problems we have, because this system is systematically breaking down for the majority of the people. All right. And so we have uh, we have uh, uh, basically sort of two orders of problems here, too. Let's put uh, Donald Trump aside. I think everybody is sort of hopefully uh, is familiar with his failures. And when you hear our numbers, like you said, four percent of the world's population, 25 percent of uh, the world's deaths. I want to talk about in a moment other countries and the way that they deal with this and not just the way that they deal with it now, but what was in place before the the pandemic hit, the way their society is organized, the political choices they have made that made them much more resilient when it came to the pandemic. Because I just want to remind people, we have two different, um, they're not, they're not distinct from each other, but they're two sort of silos of issues. And maybe silo is not the right word. Cause like I say, they're not distinct. We have that the response to the, the health crisis which we have failed miserably at. And like you say, in part because of systemic reasons, because it is not profitable to keep all this stuff in, you know, in reserve and a government needs to step in and do it. And then the other is, is that our incentive structure in this country is such that it encouraged people to go out and work States that didn't have uh, funds it wanted people to open up. I mean, look, everybody wants to go out, but we could all go out and do stuff and not actually have to go to work and subject ourselves to these risks uh, if we made other choices. Talk about, A, start with how other countries 
we're already in a, in a situation to deal with this better than we were. And then about that second order issue where, you know, the fact that there's not proper transportation, that there's a need for people to go into work, to, et cetera, et cetera, have increased, I guess, the um, virulence of this pandemic. Sure. There's a lot of ways to do that. Let me pick one that I think gets at it uh, right to the core. Uh, in Europe, to take examples of Germany, France, Italy, the Scandinavian countries, so on. In Western Europe, for sure, but in Europe as a whole, a decision was made that the way to handle this uh, virus was by, and let me underscore this, not, not firing millions of workers. For example, at the beginning in March, unemployment rate in Germany was 5%. Today, it's 6%. No mass increase in unemployment. In Italy, it's even more dramatic. The unemployment rate a year ago, when no one ever heard of the virus, was um, higher than it is today. In other words, they've lowered their unemployment through the virus. What the United States did is unusual. It is, in fact, and I say this as a professional economist, it is insane. It is crazy behavior. What you need is what the Europeans did. The government there went and it helped the corporations, but there was a condition attached. It was so universal, it didn't even have to be spoken. And the condition was, we the government will use the taxpayers' money to help you through this crisis. We will give you enough money to cover 60, 70, 80% of the payroll. <clears throat> but in exchange, you fire nobody. You're not going to, we're not going to allow you to add to the difficulty of people fearful for their illness, fearful for their lives, fearful for what is happening to their society to be given another problem, namely, you got no job, you've got no guarantee that the job will be there when this is over, or what the conditions would be, even if you get the job. We're not going to do that to you on grounds of human cruelty. So there was no unemployment. Guess what? Since the workers couldn't go to work or could do so only under limited conditions, but they were still getting paid, they could be given the task of making the workplace self, uh, safe, move the desks apart, move the cubby holes around, create social distancing, put in the plexiglass screens so we don't breathe on each other, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Here's the contrast with America's capitalism. We fired tens of millions of people. Over 50 million people have had to go to the unemployment office and file a claim to get their unemployment. 50 million people, it's a quarter of our labor force, more than a third of our labor force has had to go through this excruciatingly difficult period. Okay, why? Well, because you couldn't think through all of this. You didn't understand that an unemployed person is not a person who over the last six months might have been given a good government jobs. You know to do what? To test everybody, which we haven't done. To make safe workplaces, which we haven't done. To open the transportation system so it can handle moving people during a virus. I mean, we could have been doing wonderful things, but instead we created a miserable population anxious about their, their job. I mean, the level of failure here goes way beyond the virus to a system that is really screwed up. And here we sit now doing what? Threatening parents will either either will send your kid to a school where he or she may contract a horrible disease and bring it home or do without the school as a child care institution so you can't go to I mean, the level of dysfunction that for me as i watch this leaves me with one burning question which i ask you sam namely why do the people of this country tolerate a system that works so badly i you know i i, I mean i think this is this is the i think the thing that uh, that i think is that i find sort of really um uh, disturbing but also fascinating is i i don't think that there is an awareness broadly speaking amongst the american public 
that this was that there were choices that were involved here that were choices even put aside for a moment our current sort of political situation because it's deadlocked and this and that but there are choices that we make as a society that are ideological like people think that it's just normal and there's an absence of ideology in the notion that we could go and pay a company and say look because we sort of did it right like the paypex Paycheck Protection Program was like a real sort of like bank shot version of it. It was limited. It was cumbersome. We made it really difficult. We sort of do it when we pay people an extra $600 on the unemployment end. But again, that's cumbersome. It's got to go. We could have done this very directly. We could have spent, I I don't know, maybe a little bit more money, maybe less. Uh, Who knows? But there is an ideological sort of block here that people I don't even think most Americans realize is an ideology. And that ideology is, and it's one that's not shared by any other country in the world. I mean, this idea that like, because we're giving, I mean, talk a little bit about this, because I've interviewed many people there. ProPublic has a great piece on, on the implications of the CARES Act and how generous our government has been with corporations, but without any strings attached. And then so stingy with people, they did a great piece on Cleveland where they saw the dis- disparity here between a corporation that received um, basically free money, essentially from the government, and then everybody else. And the results are, are obvious. But will you explain to people this dynamic? Because the Fed is, did something in the CARES Act. They, they were given money by Treasury, which, which basically was the backstop for a huge lending program that was unprecedented. Will you just explain that? to Because we're doing this, folks, is the point. It's just that um, we're pretending we're not so that people don't realize like we're doing it strictly for the benefit of one sector of our private economy and with no, no strings attached. And it, it basically, they're like a helium balloon flying up to the atmosphere while the rest of us are sort of like, you know, suffering from it. I'd I'd be glad to, and I'm glad you pointed it out. And I think historians will look back on this the way we look back on the tulip craze back in the 17th century, one of the great examples of a speculative boom that became a bubble that then burst and hurt a lot of people. And that's what this one is going to do too. Here's how it basically works. The treasury takes a portion of our tax payments and says it's we're setting it aside to be a kind of backstop for the Federal Reserve. That enables the Federal Reserve to create new money that's very important to understand, literally to create it, whether that takes the form of bills and the coins we carry in our pocket or electronic money, simply creates accounts at the Federal Reserve for private banks around the country uh, to take that money for themselves. It can make loans many times larger because the assumption is we can lend a billion, the most we need in reserve is a hundred million because we'll have the money coming in and out uh, otherwise. That's a normal banking procedure. But it's important here to understand what the Fed then did. For the first time in its history, it began directly providing credit to corporations. Limitlessly, and we're talking trillions of dollars. Here's how it works. Any company that has any problem, for example, what it produces has no market. People don't want it anymore. Or they're having a fight with their unions and they can't get their their, their business going. Or their technology is badly out of date or whatever the problem. We have now created a situation where the quickest, easiest, and cheapest way to solve the problem is to get new money. Any corporation goes to a bank, says, give us a loan. Normally, the bank would have rules and regulations, but it doesn't anymore. Sure, it says, how much do you want? Why? Because the bank knows that within moments after giving the loan to, let's call it the ABC company, the bank turns around and sells that loan to the Federal Reserve. There it is. The Federal Reserve uses the fresh new money it created to buy the debts of private corporations. Having driven interest rates to next to nothing, the Fed has done that too, it's saying to a corporate America, here, 
we have all the money you need and the interest will be virtually nothing. So here it is. Solve your problems. You can't sell your goods. Don't go out of business. The Federal Reserve will backstop you. Go to any bank. The bank gets fees for all of this. So they make money even though they don't hold on to the loan. It's all very nicely greased for the banks to do it. They're doing it. Every corporation in America is borrowing money like there's no tomorrow under these circumstances. And the irony is they're right. There is no tomorrow. You might as well borrow now because this ship is going down. That's the unspoken. And the people in the corporate America, they know what they're getting. They're getting their last chance. Here's all the money in the world. It costs you next to nothing. Do your best, man. Hope you make it because the rest of the economy is hanging on whether you do or not. And, and, and let's be clear. These corporations are made up of individuals who decide their compensation packages. So That's this isn't a situation where they're saying like, oh, we're going to use this to, to, uh, to sort of make our businesses more durable. And I mean, maybe some are, but a lot of them are going, this is a good time for me to get a bonus. Absolutely. And so we're just increasing wealth inequality and we're basically handing them money. And the, the average American, not even the average, the vast majority of Americans are not participating in this massive transfer of wealth. That's right. And, and it's a holiday time. And it's, I, I don't know what the numbers are, but it's somewhere between a quarter, I would guess around a quarter of American corporations are now in debt to the Federal Reserve. Uh, by the way, for your libertarian friends or for your conservative friends, let's be real clear. The private capitalist sector is now on life support credit from the Federal Reserve. The, the very idea that we have a private sector that's separate from the government sector is now officially a total fake, a total joke. The corporate sector is desperate. That's why any hint that interest rates might go up by Jerome Powell uh, is a cause for alarm. The stock market takes a tank. The government is the only thing that keeps this broken system going. And it does so in the way the people at the top want. One last point. When you get a loan, if you're a company, you go to a bank, you get a loan. Let's be clear. The board of directors, that's about 12, 15 people in every corporation. They're the ones who decide what to do with the loan. And there's 800 easy ways to use it to pay dividends to shareholders, keep them happy, pay out a big fat pay packages to your top executives, have a big splurge in your PR department, give them a chunk so they can make it look like you're a big guardian of the environment or whatever game you're playing. I mean, we are being taken for a ride by a system that's going down. And with each passing day, it's up to those of us who see this because it's our job to say to the American people, you really have a choice here. Change the system or you're at risk of going down with it. And, 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 and people should just keep in mind here. I mean, the, the, the actual, the, the involvement of the government in the um, private economy is um, in and of itself not problematic, it seems to me. It is that it's simply, um, it's going to such a narrow set of people that it is not durable, <laughs> right? I mean, it's just like literally like if you're to build a, a house and you're to make it top heavy, mm -hmm. it's going to tip over. And the bottom line is that if the government was basically giving money to workers to stay at home or to work only in a safe situation, the, the corporation is a pass through in this instance, if they were doing that, you would have a lot happier, a lot less stressed individuals out there, and you would have a much wider base to the economy. It'd be far more durable going forward. You know, they invent, you're absolutely right. They invented a phrase to justify giving the money to the top. And the phrase that came to stick was called trickle down economics or trickle down economic policy. Now, the idea was as simple as it sounds. You give money to the top, but it's okay because it will trickle down to everybody else. And the answer to that always was, 
the facts, which is you gave an awful lot to the top and an awful little trickled down. That was the empirical critique. But a much better critique would be the one that has said, hey, if you give to the top and it doesn't trickle, you will have helped the people who need it least and you will not have helped the people who need it most and the ones who need it most are the majority. So that's a failed policy. So here's an alternative. Let's call it trickle up. You give money to the people at the bottom, they will then go into the stores and buy. That will produce profits for the corporations. And let's give it to the people at the bottom who need it most, who are the majority. And then let's hope it trickles up. And uh, maybe it will and maybe it won't, but we'll be left with the majority of people helped. And that's more than what we're left with when you leave it at the level of trickle down. Okay. So let me ask you this. And we just have a couple of minutes left. What, um, let's assume for a moment that uh, Joe Biden wins um, the presidency. He gets in and let's assume for the moment, um, because I'm feeling very optimistic these days, uh, that um, the the Democrats take the Senate and the House and um, all the Democrats, all these new Democrats who come in who may be um, a little bit more oriented towards, you know, the, the, the ideological perspective that government shouldn't be involved in these things unless it's just for corporations, right? They don't add that part of the, the phrase, but that's sort of like, it, that, that's sort of um, understood at least amongst themselves. What, what would you do? Is there like a, I know there's no silver bullet, but what would you say is the number one priority? What would you start with that you think can make our economy more resilient or at the very least, lessen the opportunity for people to be immiserated in these uh, in these type of situations? Well, you know, it's, it's hard to do this in a short amount of time, but let me try. If you want an economic system to serve the people in general, then you got to put the people in general in charge. We have a hopeless effort in this country. We give a tiny group of people, the employers of this country, who, I'll be generous, are three or 4% of our people, our employers. All the rest are employees, right? If we give a tiny group like the employers the dominant position in every enterprise, every factory, every store, every office, a tiny group of people, the board of directors of a corporation, the owner of the enterprise, whatever we want to call it, this tiny group, we can't then be surprised that when you put them all together, they do what's best for them. So that's why they give out the profits as shareholder dividends, or they give out the profits as pay packages for the CEO. Why are we surprised by this? If we don't want these outcomes, if we don't want a handful of corporations handing out millions of dollars in donations to Republicans and Democrats, and therefore, of course, getting what they want, then we have to stop organizing our enterprises in the way that we had. And the alternative we call, for lack of a better term, worker cooperatives. But the basic idea is to democratize the enterprise. If democracy is good where you live, why the heck isn't it good where you work? Why don't we have the majority, one person, one vote, make the decisions in each workplace, what you're producing, how you're producing, where you're producing, and here comes the big one. What are you going to do with the profits your enterprise has generated that you all helped to produce? How are they going to be used? For what ends? If you want that discretionary profit, the surplus, to be used for the mass of people, you've got to make the mass of people make those decisions. And let me assure you, if you averaged it, if you took a, a decision as a worker co-op, democratically, how are we going to pay everybody? It wouldn't in a million years give five people millions of dollars while everybody else can't send their children to college. Wouldn't happen. That's not how democracy or, or majorities have ever worked. That would be a breakthrough. And if we just created a sector of the American economy, let's call it the worker co-op sector, you know, uh, the province of Emilia Romagna in Italy, 40% of enterprises, that's the area around uh, Bologna, uh, Bologna, Bologna in the north, 
40% uh, of enterprises there are worker co-ops. The people in that part of Italy can see what a worker co-op is, how it works. They actually have freedom of choice to work in a top-down capitalist enterprise or a democratic worker co-op. We don't have that choice in the United States because we don't have a sector that can let everybody know what kind of life it is if you work in a democratic co-op rather than a hierarchical capitalist enterprise. And we these are the I know these are fundamental changes, but our problems aren't little anymore and we got to think a lot bigger or else we're going to miss this moment. And just to be clear, my understanding is that at the very least there was a bill uh, introduced and it may have I, it may have passed. But at one point there was a bill introduced by uh, the, the Democrats to uh, provide bridge loans to um, uh, employees of family owned companies that were going out of business or they wanted to sell it. Right. And it would provide bridge loans to the employees who could then purchase the company from the, uh, the family that owned it. So that the employees could take it over, and there it is. There's your workers' co-op. I mean, Absolutely. so there are there are instances. First of all, it's not that crazy of an idea. No. We we have actually come very close to at least instituting it on some level, and we could easily have a government policy where we are providing just simply loans, like we did to GM, like we're doing right now to all these corporations. Instead. We're going to employ it. We're going to we're going to um, uh, offer these loans, these low cost loans to employees to buy their company. They can create their own board of directors from the employees um, and 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 run the company. I mean, look, I, I get my coffee from a co-op. It right. it it tastes, frankly, better than uh, other coffees. But that's not necessarily the case. There may be other coffees that are better by a different co-op. I don't know. But the point is, none of this stuff is fantastical. And it all provides a lot more um, durability and sustainability for society. You know, Sam, if you ever wanted to, I could sit down, we could have a conversation. And I would take you through the Spanish example, the most famous in the world, where they have these co-ops and I've had them for decades the examples in Italy and Germany, and then the examples here in the United States. There are a whole bunch of examples. There's a whole organization called the United States Federation of Worker Co-ops that brings a kind of collective exchange of information among the growing worker co-ops in this country. So yes, it's not a new idea. It's not a fantastical idea. But I believe because of the failure of the capitalist system we're living in, it, its historical time has now come. Well, um, Professor Richard Wolf, uh, the book is The Sickness is the System When Capitalism Fails to Save Us from Pandemics or Itself. Uh, folks can start uh, with that book and read the, um, I think it's about 50 essays in there that cover a lot of this stuff. And, you know, uh, I think there is a, a broad understanding um, in this country that our capitalist system is broken and we're going to be looking for ways to fix it uh, regardless of who the president is. Well, we're going to have a much better shot at the very least, of at least trying to get to the point where we try <laughs> to, to fix it under Joe Biden. So uh, hope springs internal. We shall see. Uh, Professor Wolf, I will take you up on that, and we will do that, uh, that uh, interview on those co-ops again. Thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Sam. Be glad to talk with you at any time.